So welcome to a new edition, very special edition of Calling Mondays. Today, I have a couple of amazing guests with me because we are going to talk about one of the hottest topics at the moment in SEO, it, or I don't know if I should say E-A-T. With me today, I have Mary Haynes from Mary Haynes Consultancy. She's the founder and director of her own SEO consultancy company. And also Lily Ray is director of SEO of Path Interactive. And hello, Mary and Lily, how are you? Hey, I'm well considering the circumstances, um, but, uh, but yes, things are good here. Thanks, Aleda. Very, very happy to hear it. You, Lily, how's everything going? Pretty good, all things considered. It's a little crazy in New York, but hanging in there. Thanks for having me. Well, thank you for coming despite the corona craziness indeed and the lockdown craziness and today, the update craziness too, right? Exactly, yes. I know we, we were thinking, yeah, we were thinking that Google would hold off on major updates perhaps uh, during the midst of coronavirus, but mm -hmm. it'll be interesting to see what's going to come of this. It's going to be interesting and potentially very hard to analyze, so see what indeed. happens. Trends that are completely off from what we tend to see during this time. You cannot do a typical year-over-year uh, -year comparison already because the trend has changed in the, in the last weeks already, month over month, also not necessarily. Let's see what happens. So the first question actually, expertise, authoritativeness, and trustworthiness, right? Imagine that I am not an, an SEO and I come to ask you, what is it and why should I care about it? So to me, EAT is um, authenticity, really. And uh, I think you could combine it with just being known. Um, so, you know, that's obviously the authoritativeness. Um, and I think if, you know, those of us who have been in SEO for more than, let's say, pre-Penguin, uh, so, you know, before 2012, you could remember times where, uh, you know, I could decide, like, hey, I want to create this website on some topic I've never even, you know, I'm not an expert on, I've never heard of, but because I'm good at SEO, I can build links, I can do all the right things and get it to rank well. And, um, you know, throughout the years, uh, and we can debate as to when, you know, Google started getting really, really good at this, but... Um, they started to find ways to make it so that the websites that Google was ranking, for the most part, are truly the, the best. Um, and I know people will argue with that because they'll say, well, wait, this, this site is outranking me and they're not the best of their kind. Um, but maybe they're seen as the most authoritative. They're, you know, and so Google has put together a bunch of many, many factors that um, real human beings could connect uh, to say, oh, yeah, yeah, this is a business that I can trust or uh, that knows what they're talking about. Um, so to me, it's mostly about authenticity and Google trying to measure whether you're truly authentic, whether um, you're good for people or whether you're not. Just to add to that, I think um, there's also this layer, this is kind of my interpretation of it, but there's this layer of like extra scrutiny that Google is using in its algorithms because of things like misinformation and just combating bad actors like you know, previously, like Marie mentioned, it was really easy to spam the algorithm. And EAT is a new, like, spam filter in a way. Um, by putting your name behind something and by associating your authors and your experts with, like, people that are putting their names out there and building a reputation for themselves and being trusted in their industries, you're holding websites accountable to providing trust for the information, which I think is something that all the social media platforms are, are considering right now and focusing on. Indeed, as, as you mentioned, like, this additional criteria that sometimes is hard to measure or to evaluate in a quantitative way. It's not about content length or about the number of, uh, of links that you have towards your specific pages, right? But more about the qualitative type of criteria that a user, from a user perspective, will take into consideration when deciding if that's really an information, a piece of information that you will rely on. And I think it's important too that when you talk about an additional layer that I think there's probably many, there's probably hundreds of layers that um, Google's engineers have access to when they're writing their algorithms. So, and I think that's where the, the controversy came over whether mm -hmm. EAT was a ranking factor or not, because we're used to ranking factors being things like, oh, Google has said if you have a slow site, that's a negative ranking factor, even though it's a, you know, it could be a minor thing. Um, and we're used to things where if I have X, then Y is potentially going to happen. Whereas EAT, um, 
really Gary Ish from Google has said that it's a collection of uh, you know millions of little algorithms. I believe is what he said of baby, baby algorithms. algorithms. Was his, yeah, yeah, was his <laughs> word. Um, meaning that uh, you know it's not just one thing. It's not like you can say, oh, but this site that's outranking me um, doesn't have an author bio, so they're failing their EAT. That's not the point, right? It's not a, it's not a checklist that uh, Google can go through and say, ah, you've checked you know this box, so you must be okay. It's it's so many things. So if you imagine, like if we had this discussion say ten years ago, and we said that um, Google was going to try to make it so that only authentic websites uh, are ranking for, for, you know, we didn't know what YMYL was back then, but for important queries. Um, we would say like it's almost impossible to build an algorithm to determine whether something is trustworthy and, and uh, authoritative enough, you know, but it's not, right? And so Google, we don't know exactly how they've done it, but they've told us over the years that their goals are to surface websites that have these components that uh, that they've outlined in mostly the quality raters guidelines and other places as well as EAT. So I think that's where the confusion is, is it's not like I have people ask me, how do I improve my EAT score? There, it's okay. not like there's a score, right? Um, so uh, that's it's a hard concept to grasp that it's not one single thing that we can say, ah, if I do this, I'm going to be seen as uh, having high EAT by so Google. So do, do you believe that this is where the con controversy comes? Because I know that there's this controversy regarding EAT because for me, it is, these are reasonable criteria. Yeah, I, there's a, I think there's a lot of reasons why it's controversial. And one of them is what we're talking about, which is that, you know, traditionally with SEO, we could generally pin things down to specific tactics that we've done. Oh, I put the keywords in the title tag or the URL or like the H1 tag or like whatever traditional SEO was, you know, but now it's like this more qualitative thing where it's a little bit more subjective and, you know, Google's quality guidelines, if you read them, you know, for many people they're agreeable, but for some people they're not. Like for some people they have a different philosophy than what Google does. So when you're telling quality raters that this is what high quality means, and maybe somebody fundamentally disagrees with the, the quality guidelines, that's going to create an algorithm that's somewhat subjective in a way. So I think that's one of the big controversies as well. It's like, who is Google to say that this is what high quality looks like, um, or that hate speech should be filtered out or something like that. Uh, so that's one of the reasons as well. But I do think more often than not, the controversies just come from people not knowing what the signals are that feed into EAT and debating about that and then, you know, extrapolating from the results, oh, I think that this is what the high quality signals are on the site that's driving good performance and good EAT, but Google's not going to confirm that, you know, directly. So that's, it leaves a lot up for interpretation. So let's go and tackle, I think, something very important because as you mentioned before, sometimes this whole controversy comes because it's hard to pin out or to point out those specific signals that we should focus on to to improve it right based on your experience i would like that you share specific actions that us as seos can do and should do to improve our it whenever we're working in an seo process or and those that you think that are fundamental whenever you tend to see that a client has lost their the rankings after a core update, for example? It's actually a tough question to answer because it's, again, the whole idea of EAT not being a single ranking factor um, means that there's not, it's not like you can just, it's not like page speed where we can say, do these, you know, these five things and your, your site will load faster. Um, and so our goals when we're trying to help uh, a site that we feel has dropped in uh, Google traffic because they're lacking EAT, um, is to figure out where are the holes. So that's the first thing is, uh, and the best guide that we have to do that with is Google's quality raters guidelines. Um, very long read, but I find it fascinating. I, I, I don't know, Lily, how many times have you read the quality raters guidelines? Oh <laughs> it's printed out of my desk at work, so I kind of miss it right now. Um, I don't know. I've poked through it, you know, so many different times. Lily, you actually have a, 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 Lily actually has a post like commenting on the changes. From version oh, to version, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Well, and the yeah. first thing, as soon as we heard there was a Google update, you know, first thing I did was check did the quality raters guidelines change? Because um, that's really interesting, right? That, uh, for example, in July of 2018, 
they changed the quality raters guidelines and all they did was they changed a couple little grammar things, but they added this one place where, and three words, safety of users that they wanted to protect the safety of users. Um, and so why would they go to all this trouble to republish guidelines just to put three words in it? So we took that and said, ah, we think the next Google update is going to in some way protect the safety of, of users. Um, and sure enough, the sites that saw drops with the August 1st update, right, which we all remember was, we called it medic in the SEO community, mm -hmm. um, you know, it went after bad actors in the, in the medical community. And we saw sites that um, maybe had a very bad review profile would see uh, drops in traffic or sites. Um, it wasn't in that uh, situation. It was later that we saw sites that uh, overtly contradicted scientific consensus um, that potentially could be dangerous to people saw drops. So one of the things, the first thing I would say to do is to actually, if you've been hit by a, a, a Google update, is to spend time reading through the quality raters guidelines and saying, can any of this possibly apply to my site? And it's something that can be remedied. So um, one example, would be uh, reviews. Um, let's say that Google, uh, that you have a problem in your business where people are complaining um, and the number one complaint across the internet is that uh, people can't get a refund. They can't figure out how to get a refund for your product. Well, the quality raters guidelines have several examples where they say, um, we're gonna consider this uh, low, uh, a low quality website because there are complaints about not being able to get refunds. Um, and so if that's a problem, you know, we could argue how could Google measure that? There are patents that Google has that uh, shows that they can look at the sentiment of reviews. We don't, we don't know exactly what they're doing, but they're trying to figure out what the quality raters guidelines tell us is that a business that has an overt problem with people complaining is maybe not protecting the safety of their users and maybe we shouldn't rank that as highly. So um, that's just one example. So how would you fix that? And we have had clients that have uh, done a really good job at um, fixing a bad review problem. And it's, I, I think some, some people, when they hear this, they'll think, uh, you know, okay, we got to run in and we've got to get a whole bunch of people to give us good reviews. Well, that's a possibility, but it's got to be authentic, right? I mean, I think if Google's smart enough to determine this, they can determine whether it's one person that's suddenly written a thousand positive reviews for you. Uh, but the first thing would be to fix the problem. If you have problems with people not being able to get refunds, you need to fix that problem. And that's part of why SEOs struggle with EAT. Because as an SEO, I can't make my client be better at offering refunds. Um, so that's part of the issue. As SEOs now, we're suddenly becoming uh, business consultants and saying, look, the internet is having issues with your business because of this. And Google is catching on to this. Mm -hmm. And uh, as a result, they want to rank you low. I think that there's a, a very important point of what you mentioned, that as, as SEOs, I think that we struggle. That is not something that will go and crawl and fix directly in our website content or code. But it's actually advice that we need to give to our businesses or clients to tell them to change something External. at a business level right. or marketing yeah. level mm -hmm. or communication mm -hmm. level that goes beyond our, our reach or direct reach. But if we think about it, this is how marketing consultants usually work, right? What is marketing? And SEO is also part marketing or and product mm -hmm. too. It's part product, part marketing, part, part technical, and it's advising on improved things that touches and connects with the user experience, the search experience of the user in this case, right? So I think Marie hit on it with the search quality guidelines because there's so much in there. Um, the, all the different things that I think we analyzed from an EAT perspective kind of stem from that document. So there's 100, 160 pages of things to consider in there. Um, but it, as much as it is an external thing where you do need to potentially make some changes to your, how your business operates, which is hard, I think there's a lot of things you can do on the site as well. So, um, you know, here's an example of things that we look at. So if the, if the site is your money, your life, and it talks about financial topics or health topics, and let's say you have your comment section enabled and you're allowing people to log on there and share their personal stories. And maybe those stories are like extremely inappropriate or they use like swear words or things like that, where it's kind of like unregulated, that's crawled. I mean, potentially, just depending on your setup, but that might be crawled content by Google. And now you have a YMYL page that's offering medical advice or offering financial advice that's like, you know, tons of comments are at the bottom that are 
creating just kind of like a low quality experience. Those types of things are things that you can look at from an EAT perspective to say like, is this whole page from what Google can see offering high quality advice? Or maybe like you get into the bottom of the page and you start to get really salesy in your informational content. So a lot of like the natural medicine doctors will push an agenda in the way that they write the content. And I think that that's something that Google's taken a lot of issue with, especially as it relates to like offering what should be objective information and advice. If it's too transactional or too salesy, that can get you in trouble. So almost having like a third party or a neutral person read your content, I think is a really good first step and say like, would you trust this if you didn't know me or believe in my business and you were just a random person? So that's something you can look at. What would you say that is usually the top issues that you will tend to find again and again and again uh, when question. you assess clients' websites? Uh, number one, again, is something that's very hard to fix is lack of authority. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, in the past, if I was some uh, website that was talking about, you know, cures or treatments for diabetes, mm -hmm. um, it's, it, I maybe in the past could have outranked the Mayo Clinic and, you know, um, uh, university sites and, and things like that. Uh, and that's, that's challenging now, although that can be improved greatly by good PR. So that's where, uh, you know, SEO and other uh, avenues of marketing come in. Um, that getting your brand more mentioned and more recognized by people can improve your authoritativeness. So that's not all lost. Um, and uh, the other thing that we see, so we review a lot of medical sites. And um, with the June 3rd update last year, we saw uh, a number of natural medicine sites that just plummeted. Um, and so what we started to do was go in uh, to some of the, the better. I, I mean, some of the natural medicine sites that dropped were ones that you and I would look at and go like, oh, I, you know, I wouldn't want to get information from this site. Um, but some of them were relatively decent sites that were giving good information mixed with some kind of sketchy information. Um, and so we've worked with them to trim out their content uh, to look at um, which parts of your content are maybe offering advice that would be contrary to what uh, a, a, a traditional physician would offer um, mm -hmm. and to even change the title tags on these pages uh, so that instead of saying like here's 10 essential oils that are going to cure your cancer um, to say let's talk about essential oils are they helpful for cancer patients um, okay. and you know wording like that so and we've had quite good success um, with uh, several sites that have done this uh, that have dropped with usually the June 3rd update and then with a subsequent update after making all these changes see very very nice gains so there can be things that you can do to um, that would be improving the trustworthiness of your your content Amazing. yeah I would totally agree with that I think um I keep going back to like deception as something that I see consistently throughout sites that have been hit. So whether it be, um, like you said, Marie, like if, if you're saying that can, essential oils can cure cancer, I don't know if that deception is the right word for that, but that's like, it's misleading and it's, it's not entirely fact based, you know, or like evidence based. Um, but also just deceptive, like SEO tactics. So if you do something like you create auto generate, you know, 5,000 pages and you're just replacing a few words on the page, especially if that's YMYL content. Um, maybe you used to be able to rank for those pages in the past, but that type of thing at scale, I think can create like systemic problems for your website and affect the trustworthiness of your site as a whole. So if you're trying to game the system and you're also trying to provide like YMYL services or products, I don't think that's a good combination. It makes complete sense at the end of the day. Indeed, if it is deceptive for the user, it doesn't provide value is bad experience you shouldn't be able to rank as well have you found yourself to use any additional tools or different tools than the usual ones that you will tend to use in seo audits or seo content analysis are there any specific tools or features i have a couple that i've been using lately um, to try to get kind of fancy with like eat analysis so um one thing that I did, and I talked about this uh, when Marie and I spoke together at PubCon, was uh, I've been using readable.io, so it's just one of many readability checkers, which looks at the quality of the content from like a readability standpoint, so things like flesh Kincaid reading level, number of spelling errors, number of grammar mistakes, um, how long is the content, how many paragraphs is it, things like that. So looking at that data at scale across a lot of different articles, you can start to see trends about like what does good quality content look like from a numbers standpoint. 
that's one thing I've been doing. Um, I've also been paying pretty close attention to structured data and the knowledge graph as it relates to EAT. So I published an article last week or two weeks ago about how structured data can actually play into your EAT. So things like just acknowledging who your authors are and who your organization is and when it was founded, who it was founded by, all these things produce the signals that I think Google is looking for as it relates to EAT. So structured data testing tool or custom extracts for structured data, stuff like that. I've been doing a lot more of that. Perfect. And, and that article was great, Lily. We, uh, we referenced it uh, a lot. Um, and I think uh, structured data is, is uh, it's a bit confusing because, um, you know, Google will say, well, it's not a ranking factor, uh, but the more information you can give Google to say like, hey, this is, this is our entity and we're connected, or these are our authors who are also the authors uh, on uh, this authoritative website here. Um, that type of thing can help. We had a client uh, a couple of years ago that did a rebrand and then in a Google update saw this massive drop. Um, and it, it, it turned out that their rebrand just wasn't well recognized by people. And um, from what we could see again with knowledge graph tools. So we use, uh, I believe there's one by Carl Hendy that is a, a, a good um, way yeah. to, yeah, to search the knowledge graph. Um, yeah, and when we searched for information on this company, all we could see was their old branding. And so we just had them, you know, number one, update their about page um, to make it very clear who their current company is, uh, and then update in several places that uh, the knowledge graph may draw upon uh, that, you know, the company has rebranded. Um, and they, again, they saw, they, they were a company that sold a... Um, uh, a high-end furniture and uh, within with the next update they jump from page three for their terms to uh, number one two or three for almost all of their terms and you know I, I mean I, I don't want to take credit for that because I think eventually Google would have figured it out that this is the same company um, but in doing things and adding structured data that that really helped uh, I think um, and, you know Google to figure out uh, oh yes this is that authoritative entity um, that we want to rank really really highly mm -hmm. um, so yeah the knowledge graph tool is one that uh, that we use a lot just trying to figure out what entities has Google pulled from your site um, because we really think a lot of what uh, how Google figures out EAT is in what how you're connected in terms of entities um, and another tool that uh, is a lot of fun to play with is Google's got um, a tool to help you analyze images and it will pull what entities they think uh, are in the image. And that's very that. interesting. Yeah, if you uh, throw your author's pictures in there and see, you know, does Google say, oh, we recognize this as a, a medical doctor or um, not because you're wearing scrubs and a, you know, and a stethoscope, but that they, they can recognize, you know, they could look at a, a picture of Lily and say, oh yes, she's connected with SEO. That's that's one of the goals, right? You want it so that uh, Google's algorithms can say, oh, when we see this person, this person knows their stuff on this topic. Um, so that image tool is a, is a helpful one as well. The same tool that they use otherwise, but in a different way yeah. in order to, to additionally align all the signals. And this, I, I believe that this is more about alignment in general to help Google and to give the, the right signals to Google about some particular context to finish what are the topics that you think that are super critical that you wish double down or, or to clarify or to additionally mention here regarding it before finishing i'd like to say google's blog post that they uh they mentioned they just tweeted about it yesterday when they said hey we're, we're releasing a core update um and uh here's all you need to know in this blog post and we focused on eat i mean eat when that blog post came out it was controversial because google had linked out to certain seos who had written on eat and in the midst of that controversy uh, i think people forgot that there's a lot of really good stuff in that post uh, there's bullet points there that are essentially uh, Amit Singhal's 23 questions for Panda, which were given to us many years ago. Um, and these are questions that say, I don't have them right in front of me right now, but things like, would you trust this content? Uh, would you expect to see this content written in a print magazine? Um, and there's, there's bullet point after bullet point. So I would highly encourage people to just read that Google blog post. Uh, okay. It's called uh, it's something about Google on what you need to know about core updates. Mm -hmm. And uh, those bullet points, if you can ask them uh, in an unbiased way about your own site, then I think you'll see uh, where your quality issues are. Nice. I think like the whole controversy around DAT has been so blown out of proportion at this point where it's like 
people either love it or hate it. And like, that's such an unnecessary way of approaching it. Like, I think that we should all just think about like, you know, what, what is Google hoping to aim with this? Why is it in the blog post that they continue to share over and over whenever a core update happens? Why is it such a huge part of the search quality guidelines? And why is there so much evidence that this seems to be playing a role in what we're seeing with the outcomes of these algorithm updates? Um, you know, instead of bickering amongst SEOs, I think it's an, an important thing to just learn kind of the fundamentals of how it works. I think that's where a lot of like, the controversy comes from is people just like minimizing it or trivializing it or like not understanding it conceptually. But I think it's very important for professional SEOs nowadays to really learn the role that it's playing in the algorithms and to think critically when you're analyzing websites. You know, if you run a website through Screaming Frog, that's not the only thing you need to consider when it comes to doing good SEO. It's kind of this qualitative layer of but this thinking is the, thing, the way you right? say that, this, Exactly. That, that is what I was going to mention. I remember uh, last year that I had the chance to interview the Google Webmaster team members. Martin Split mentioned something that stuck with me and doesn't make total sense, that at the end of the day, Google, what they try to do is they simulate the user when accessing and seeing our content, right? When they go to our website, they, well, there's a user agent there that is trying to simulate a device as the one used by real users. And, and then, of course, we validate many of the configurations that we know we play a role to make our content accessible and relevant and etc. And the same should be from an authority perspective, from a trust perspective, from an expertise perspective, in order to give the best possible experience and value to the user, right? More and more, and this is a thing that we have seen in latest years, how who has become much more sophisticated. I think this is the additional layer that we don't by default tend to think about when we start because of course there's always so much to do very basic sometimes from a configuration perspective callability indexability whatever that we already have so much to do but when we finish with that and and we really want to take our clients to the next level in very competitive queries we cannot leave that additional layer out that will be the one that won't only make google to better rank us necessarily, but also we need to think about this is the additional layer of how we are going to make our clients, customers to actually convert, to be more satisfied sure. and to buy more. Hopefully this video will change minds for those who still don't believe about this. And also hopefully that SEO have a little bit more influence business-wise, because I think that this were particular also a lot of challenges come, right? How come you go and tell to your client or your boss, those reviews, they are fake or don't change the wording there. Are you, are you misleading our customers? Things like that, right? Are more sensitive. Now, hopefully you have also enjoyed today's share. Thank you very much, Mary. Thank you very much, Lily. I, I had Thank a great you. time. I learned a ton and hopefully also the audience too. And please, if you do have any questions, any comments, leave it here below. And remember, if you like the video, like it, subscribe to the channel. Look, I'm becoming better at this of being a YouTuber now. <laughs> and, and of course, if you want to learn more about it, follow Mary, follow Lily, so you are always updated about it too. And thank you very much for today and uh, stay tuned for the next video that will be also a special. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. <laughs>